our, our dean search. So okay, so I push the button. So I'm going to start. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're sitting there because we're right in front of you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about Markdown because it's fun. Um, it's not like, you know, wearing a party hat and drinking a Heineken fun, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's portable, it's usable. And um, to give some context, um, uh, well, I'll just tell the story in a little bit. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a few slides, I'm going to do some housekeeping, and then I'm going to basically just do a demo and show you rendered output and what it looks like and why it's cool and that kind of stuff. So that's it. I'm just doing some expectation setting. Um, does anybody need me to enable captioning? Do you know that you can do that in a Google slide deck? I'll show people just for fun because I'm an accessibility person. Um, so I want everyone to be able to um, appreciate the experience. But down in that little bar there, you go into the preferences and you can toggle them on and off. And what I do is I put text position at the top because that way when it's recorded on YouTube, the, my captions are open captions that you can't turn on and off, so it won't interrupt with the YouTube captions and cover them. So I put them at the top, and then I make them, um, you can, you know, customize how big you want them, so I put large. So what it does is, oops, I lost it, is when I toggle them on, it moves the presentation down a little bit, but, you know, it's craptions, but it's better than nothing, so it's an option <laughs> for you, you know what I mean? So that's kind of cool. Um, so if anyone finds it distracting, since no one needed captions, if someone finds it distracting, I'll turn them off, but they're fun, anyway. Um, accessibility, there are some images in the slide deck, but none of them are for context, so I won't be describing them for people who can't see them. Um, if Usually I will describe an image, but they're just for, for reinforcement more than anything, so for accessibility, um, I won't be doing anything with um, the images. Um, I do want to say before I start that I'm very opinionated, so the views and opinions I share with you are my own. They do not represent Drupal Camp Twin Cities. They do not represent any of the Drupal board stuff I do. They do not represent the Linux Foundation, okay? So I just want to say that for um, setting some expectations too. If you want to follow along and you don't have an editor that does Markdown, you can go to trydiscord.org and um, set up an account and you can follow along with me. Going back, um, if you need um, to follow along with the slide deck to make links easier, I do have a bit.ly link for Markdown hyphen TC Drupal 23. So if you want to click on the links as I go, you can do that. Um, this is my opinion. Um, please review your hosting provider's community guidelines. When you do not take a side and you host hate groups, you take the side of the oppressor. So I'm saying this because a major community sponsor for this camp and others um, uh, have decided to be an open web and host hate groups, so please be mindful of your user guidelines and follow your community um, uh, stuff. Vote in the Drupal board election. Um, I am Amy Jean Heinlein. I am a builder of exams for the Linux Foundation. Um, I am a Drupal core mentor, so I help people contribute back to Drupal. That's what I do. I don't work in Drupal. I have other people do the work and teach them how to do it. So. Um, that's who I am, and it's Volkswagen Schick on Drupal.org and Mastodon. So why Markdown? Um, because it's cool, like I said. Um, it's not a plain text file. Um, it's a Markdown file. Um, so plain text files don't allow you to do certain things. They don't allow you to do any formatting yourself. It's just rendered. It's, there's nothing rendered. It's just plain text. Where a Markdown is formatting. It's um, easy to read. You can put in s subheadings and headings and vertical lines and links, and you, it's very portable. Um, it's kind of a mix between a text file and an HTML file, you know, and what it is is it's human readable. 
Um, and why Markdown? Because it's the future of technical documentation. Um, remember when we moved from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, our readmes are now Markdown files and not TXT files. There's a big push for that. Um, Markdown is now, some aspects of it are in Drupal Core and CK Editor 5, so there's the capability of doing that. Um, Previously, before I worked for the Linux Foundation, I worked for Red Hat on the opensource.com team, um, on the editorial team, and people would send us Google Docs. Well, what am I going to do with a Google Doc? I'm going to copy and paste it, and then I have to, well, I copy it, and then I have to plain paste it because of all the crud that's in a Google Doc, right? There's all those spans and divs and things. So for me, teaching Markdown when I worked at Red Hat, when they cared about open source, they, so when a writer would give me a Google Doc, it would take me 15 minutes to put it in Drupal. But if you gave me a markdown file, I could just drop it in and be done and everything was formatted, you know? So it's just easy. So I like to teach markdown because it's easy for our editors to look at if they don't have to know, like programming languages, and it's readable, you know? I don't know how many people, don't, does anyone not know what markdown is? Okay, so I don't have to explain, like, you can actually human read it, right? There's no HTML. Okay. Um, and it's in core, like I said. So um, there's no distracting toolbars. Um, Markdown is accessible. Like, maybe someone does not use a mouse. Um, there's less keystrokes in Markdown. You don't have to take your hand off of your keyboard to, you know, go into your editor and bold something. You can just hit the hashtag and then it's bold. Um, you have more control over how you want your stuff formatted to. So you write an article, or you write a readme, or you write in technical documentation. When you write it in Markdown, you control where the headings are. You control where the links are. The person who's editing your file doesn't have to do that. You have more control over what you're, what you're doing. And it's not really code. Um, so, Kind of the basics before I go into the demo is you have to start with an MD file. You know, get rid of the TXT and you have to have an MD file. That way your editor knows that you're, that you're writing in Markdown. Um, you have to get to know your flavor of Markdown. Um, there's all different kinds of flavors. There's um, common Markdown, there's common Mark, there's GitHub flavored Markdown, there's GitLab flavored Markdown. I think of them as dialects. Like I come from California, so I speak, you know, a little bit differently um, within someone who uh, is from Texas. You know, there's that dialect, and that's kind of what these flavors are. So just understand what flavor of Markdown you want to use. Understand when you do want to make it portable, why it doesn't work, like why something in GitLab doesn't render right in GitHub. So just kind of get to know your flavor, and then find a good editor. Um, there's all different kinds out there. I have a list of open source markdown editors. Um, I really like Joplin. Um, I like VS Codium. So if you use VS Code, it's not open source, just so you know, but VS Codium is, and that has a really good um, rendering where you can have the window open and you can see what you're writing and how it's gonna look, so, which is kind of neat, because sometimes you forget like how to do it exactly right. Um, and then I have some not so cool markdown editors listed. These are the ones that are uh, not open source. Obsidian. It's a great, I don't know, does anyone know what Obsidian is? It's, it's really cool, look at it. it, it, it Heard of it. Yeah, it's really cool, but it's not open source and they steal your data, so you know. But it's a really cool thing if you like to link files and it's very dynamic and it's just cool. And that's why I have this list up there, just so I can t t suggest um, uh, um, suggest that. Sorry, I'm a little uh, flustered. Um, so we're going to go through just the basics. This is sort of a list, but we don't need to go through them because we're going we're gonna to talk about them in the demo. Um, so if you want to follow along, like have it in front of you, um, I have a GitLab instance because um, GitLab is cool because GitHub is not open source. Another thing that you all should know, do your stuff in GitLab. Volkswagen Chick Markdown in Minutes is the link, but you don't have to go there if you don't want to. Um, and let's start the demo. So here's, thank you, here's my GitLab instance. Um, you can see that all of these, like I said, started with Markdown files. 
you know, when you go to the base repository, you have a README. So here's my README. Nicely formatted. There's some horizontal lines. There's some um, links. We've got some headings. If you come over here, and this is why it's relevant in Drupal, this is an example um, README from the Gen theme. So you can see how there's a bulleted list. You can see the heading. You can see um, code formatting. This is all written in Markdown. So if you go here and you look at the code, you can see it's human readable. You know what I mean? Like we formatted all that stuff, but we just did it with a couple of keystrokes. You know, here's our bulleted list that came out bulleted list. And it's accessible. These are accessible bulleted lists, accessible headings. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is inline um, formatting. So we're going to talk about italics, bolds, and strike throughs. So you can see here, you know, we have italics. Um, let's look at the code because that's what we're learning. So you can see that there's a couple of different ways to do italics. You can add one asterisk or underscore before and after your word with no spaces. No spaces. So you have an asterisk or an underscore before and after with no spaces. Let's look at that rendered again just so you can see that. So it does it the same thing, but you can do it two different ways. We have bold. Bold is very similar, but you have two asterisks and two underscores with no spacing. And then we have strike through, which is two tildes before and after, the tilde sign here. So if you look at it rendered, you can see that it's oh, off the, we have strike through. And then we have block quotes, you know? Let's look at that in the code. It's the greater than sign. Pretty simple. So like I said, just with a few keystrokes, we can format a file. So after inline, um, we have headings and line breaks. So headings are really important. Remember, they're not for style. They're for accessibility. So. The headings are for accessibility. So there's a few different ways you, that you can do headings. Um, to create a heading, you add a number sign in front of the word or the phrase. So if we look at the code, there's the hashtag with a space. So if your heading doesn't render, it's because you didn't have a space. So that's a little bit, you know, we didn't have spaces in between our formatting and the other ones, but we have spaces here. So the number of number signs that you use determines what level of a heading it is. So if you have five, five um, hashtags, it's a heading level five. And remember, headings are nested. That's why we do it for accessibility. Your most important topic, it's like an outline for your, for your essay. So if we look at that again, we can see, yes, it's style, but we're not using it for style. So we have a heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, and heading five. But there's another way you can do it. You can do what you want your heading to be with equal signs underneath it or dashes, and it renders the same. But it only goes for level one and level two. There's no level three heading and level four heading when you style it like this. So we have the, the, the um, equal signs and the, and the dashes. Again, looks the same. And then we have horizontal rules. We like horizontal rules. And those are just simply um, three dashed lines. So I have three dashed lines here. And if we look at it, we have that horizontal line. OK, links. There's a lot of different ways to do links. I'm only going to do like the most um, approachable links. But as you get more into Markdown, you can style them different ways. Um, you can format them different ways. So for URL, we have a link text that is enclosed by square brackets. And then immediately after, we have the URL with parentheses. So that might be confusing, but if we look at the code, we have our link text in brackets, no space, and then our URL in parentheses. So I have Drupal Camp Asheville with the URL. Brackets, 
parentheses. We'll look at that one more time before moving on. So it's the same, you know, Drupal Camp Asheville is a link. Doesn't underline it, it depends on your program, but it does change to color. So if we want to add a title to a link, so if I come down here and I hover, I now have a title there. So if I look at the code, I have Drupal Camp Asheville, the brackets with the parentheses. And then afterward, before I close my parentheses, I have in quotes the title that I want when I hover. So Drupal Camp Asheville, the URL, a space, and then even quotes what the title's going to be. If you want a relative link within a repository, like this is we, the first page we looked at was the base of my repository, we can have our brackets. And then we don't have to have the beginning of the URL. We can just have that one at the end. So if we want to look at what that means, we go here. A relative link within a repository. So if I click on that, it takes me to that, back to the files. So I'm going to close that so I'm not confused. Again, let's look at the code again because that might be confusing. You don't have to have it if it's within your website. So if you're in one Drupal site, you don't have to have all of the stuff. You just have that relative link. Email addresses, pretty straightforward. You enclose them in, in brackets or to turn a URL into an address link. So if you see that, just with brackets, we formatted it and it now becomes a link and it's not just text. And those are in brackets with no spaces. So lists are cool. Lists are cool. We have ordered lists, we have unordered lists, um, and then there's a cool one at the end I'm gonna show. So to create an ordered list, um, an ordered list versus an unordered list, if you don't know what that means. An order list is the one, two, three, four, and an and a, and a, and a unordered list is more like bullet points. So there's two ways that you can do ordered lists. You can list them, you know, your one, two, three with a period and space. Or, let's look at the code because that's the fun part. You can list them one, two, three, and four, or you can just put one at the beginning and it will do the numbering for you. So if you ever mess up, you know how we mess up and we break the wrong number sometimes, it fixes it for you. So that's cool in a markdown file. Can't do that in a text file. Um, unordered lists, they're bullets, and there's a few different ways you can do this. You can use a dash, an asterisk, or a plus sign. And they're all kind of the same. You know, a dash with a space, an asterisk with a space or plus with a space. So if we look at it rendered, you can see it's the same ordered list, but you can do it three different ways. So, you know, it's sometimes easier for someone to hit a plus sign because that's a more familiar thing, you know, more of a, of a muscle memory thing. So that's kind of nice that they give you options. And you can combine the two, which is cool. And this is what we do in readmes a lot, right? We have our ordered lists and then we have bulleted lists. So if you look at the code for that, pretty straightforward. You have your numbered list like we had at the top. And then we indent until, I think that's called a hanging indent where you do it immediately, like dropping down from the, the, the first word. So we have our ordered lists and then we have our bullet points in the inside. And we keep that same formatting of that space in between. But that's combining the two. So look at that again. Makes it nice, you know? Breaks it down. Um, when we're doing technical documentation, lists and bullet points are important because we don't want walls of text. So break, break up your points with bullet points and, and headings and all that kind of stuff. That's the key to doc technical documentation too, is making sure that everything's kind of broken down into pieces and Markdown helps you do that. So the next thing is a task list. Look how cool this is. Like we have a checkbox and we have a strike through, like that's cool. And it's pretty straightforward. So if I look at the, the code, you can see we kind of did the, the same thing that we did before with our bullet points, 
but we just have the brackets, like a checkbox, right? So when we finish, we exit. When we didn't want to do something anymore, we struck it through. Remember that tilde from the strike through? If we look at that again, the X that we filled into the brackets makes a checkbox, and then our strike through crosses out the list. So that's that's neat, and again, only you know, just in, in, in a markdown file. Drop downs. I don't think this is accessible. Um, so if accessibility is important, don't use it, but I like to give an example of what you can do. So we have a drop down. If I select that, it drops down some answers, right? What is the best Drupal camp in the world? And then I have some answers. So if I close it, if we look at the code, we have drop downs, so we start with details and we end with details, right? But we have a summary, that's our question, and then we have answer one, answer two, and answer three. And we do have line breaks, we do have to do a little bit of HTML to make that drop down. So it's a kind of a cross between markdown and HTML, these drop downs, but they're really cool and that's why I wanted to show it. So. Um, I don't even have Twin Cities on that list. I'm very sorry. Um, so, oh, oh, I do. That's it. Okay, okay. Um, so it's your choice which one is the best Drupal camp in the world. But again, you know, if you look at the code, or if you look at it rendered, here's the drop down. Makes it nice. So if you're like building a test for something, or you know, you don't want to use a form, you can do that. Um, how do you format code? So there's two different kinds of code that we could use in technical documentation. We have inline code, where it's along, you know, in the middle of a sentence, and then we have code blocks. So inline code, what we do is we um, enclose it with no space with back ticks. We do this in Slack too, remember? Um, we back tick, I love Drupal. And then for a code block, we'll start with three back ticks and we'll end with three back ticks. So if we look at it, the code, you can see my, my back tick, I love Drupal, makes the you know inline formatting and three three ticks are on different lines. You know, you can't do it here or here, you have to do it on separate lines. So you have three back ticks, what you want in your code, and three back ticks, and that makes the, the code block. So we'll look at that again. So you know when you're looking and depending on what you're looking at, like some some of our code blocks will be in gray. Depends on how what editor you use and you render it. But when you're looking at a README or you're looking at like, you know, a tutorial, having those code blocks is nice because you can copy and paste it, right? So we don't want to use images of code blocks in our articles because images you can't copy and paste. So this saves like if you're writing technical documentation for some like editorial magazine or something like that. Having a screenshot doesn't do your your consumer any good because they can't copy and paste it. You know that's great for command line stuff. It's great for, um, uh, like I said, it's just e easily distinguishable. And then this, I see it most of the time formatted where this is gray. And then depending on your theme, you can have it where your in inline code can be formatted um, different colors depending on what language you're doing or you know what kind of terminal you're using. But again much easier than images, for, uh, especially for command line stuff, to, to do it in code blocks. Look at it again, like I said, back ticks and um, one for inline and three back ticks for code block. So tables, did you know you could make a table in Markdown? Kind of cool. Um, there's a couple of different types of tables. We have tables that are left aligned. We have tables that are right aligned. And we have tables, there's more. I'm not, I don't want to do any spoilers, so I'm only going to scroll down a little bit. And then we have tables that are center aligned. So how do you do that? Well, it's pretty straightforward. So the table, we start with the pipe key. The pipe key is above your return key. It's pipe key. So we have a pipe key. We have our heading up here. And then to, to to declare what side you want it aligned on, we use a colon. So for this left aligned table, I have a colon on the left hand side. For my right, I have a colon on the right hand side. And then for ones that are centered, I have a colon 
on both sides. And you know, our tables are formatted with the pipes. We have a space in between. So again, looking at it rendered, we had our colon declaring on the left-hand side. We had our colon declaring on the right-hand side. And then our center aligned. And we can also do tables that are a mix of things. Look, I have one side being left aligned, one column being centered, and one column being right. Um, depending on how much data you have in your table, it's best to do left aligned or right aligned for accessibility because that when it's centered justified, some people have a hard time like going from line to line. So for accessibility, if it's one word, it's okay to be centered, but if you have a lot of information in that table group, it's best to do right or left justified. Um, and then we don't always have to have our tables filled in either. But you have to be careful with the markdown editor you use because that might not be accessible because if a screen reader's going through there, it might not know that that table is, you might not tell your um, content consumer that that's an empty square, so just be mindful of that. But you can do it. So if we look at the code, I was able to declare it three different ways depending on the column. And then when you don't want to have anything in your column, you leave it blank with the space. So let's look at that one more time just to build it down. So you can do the right aligned, the center aligned, the left aligned, do a combination, and then actually have some spaces empty too. Again, it's that colon declaring what side of the table. And the pipe is what tells it it's a table. So one more time just to kind of look at it. We have the pipes, we have the colons, and we have the dashes, and that's how you make the table. Pretty straightforward. You don't have to do any like opening up of a design file. You can just do it with a couple of keystrokes. So this one's really cool. Look, I don't have to open Figma to, to do a flow chart. I can do this in GitLab Markdown. I think GitHub might have it now, but I don't use GitHub very much. Um, so how cool is that? Are those accessible? The flow those charts? charts? Um, natively. Na natively, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, so that is you can tap through it. I don't know about a screen reader, though, because I don't use a screen reader personally. I, don't, I find myself not wanting to give advice on screen readers because I'm not a native user. Okay. Well, I'm not either, but yeah. yes, it would be nice to, to know. I'll, I'll ask elsewhere on that. I can ask my accessibility group, too. Um, yeah. Because I gave this presentation in Asheville, and my friend Carrie Fisher was in there, and she's, she's really an expert in accessibility. And she didn't mention this being non-accessible. She did mention, like, the table, if it was empty, being not accessible, and then the drop-downs not being accessible. And she didn't say anything about the flow diagram, so I assume she would have. But that's just an assumption. Yeah. So. Um, but, like, that's cool, right? You can do them a diff few different ways. And so if we look at the actual markdown, it's a little library that we use called Mermaid. So I have, I'm not sure why the ticks are there, but I think it's because you're declaring a library. So I have Mermaid, I have Graph, TD, and a colon. And then I have my A that points to my B with two dashes and an arrow, and then a colon. And then I have A pointing to C, B pointing to D, and C to D. So I call the library, I told it there was some graph table data, and then I declared its position. So let's look at that again. You can see I have A to B, A to C, C to D, B to D. And then you can like mess around with it and do it different ways too. So I have A to B, B to D, D to C, you know, it skips. And last time we did this demo, we kind of played around with it because we wanted to see if we could get like the lines to cross and do things and we couldn't do that. So I'm not sure. Um, and we spent a good five or 10 minutes we're, like working on that. So it's pretty much like your lines aren't gonna cross, but you don't want them to like intersect anyway, just as a, right. as a point. But if we look at it again, You know, you declare your library, and you just do A to B, A to D, and you can change these around. So we'll do some, just to fool around with it. 
And then what kind of rules do you have for the text, for the A or B or whatever? Because those are placeholders. Like, or, uh, right, you, know, you want to see text in there? Yeah. Sure. And if there's rules about what kind of things you can, are there special characters? Um, special characters do not work well because okay. we're in in this and I think that I'm not a coder or programmer you have to like declare the special character in a certain way oh, okay. so I'm sorry that I don't have that no it's just so. it's, uh, you mean like using an ASCII character or something? yeah yeah okay so if I want like yeah. to say table Because we'll have uh, things like, you know, person one mm -hmm. uh, sends email to person two, will be the first, mm -hmm. or sends email, and then it's like, is it answered? You know, there was an arrow, does, is it answered? It's not answered, okay, you do this, if it's answered, you do this, if it's mm -hmm. not answered, it's that kind of thing. Yeah, then, but yeah, I just replaced the, the one character with the word. Yeah, okay. That. So there's a way you can embed images too, but I don't know how to do that. So, yeah. Yeah, we have a variety of flow charts. I mean, a lot of them are swim lane mm -hmm. flow charts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what's nice about doing it in Markdown is it only took me like one second to edit it. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to open my program. I didn't have to design anything. I didn't have to yeah. do anything. I didn't have to. Anyone, anyone can go into this GitLab file, and you know, my marketer can go in here and edit it. She doesn't right. have to like have Figma. She doesn't have to have Canva. You know. Yeah. You know, it's one less tool. You know, so. Okay, so like I said, this was just the basics. So I did the basics. And I'm gonna go back to my presentation for a second. Um, uh, anyone know Mike Anello? Mike Anello, he's kind of a cool guy. He runs like a Drupal bootcamp called Drupal Easy. Um, he's on like the CWG, he does some pretty cool stuff. Um, he had a Drupal 7 site for his academy website that he couldn't migrate because um, the Markdown module was not ready. It, Mark Conroy wrote the Drupal 7 Markdown module years ago and um, it just never got ported to Drupal 8, it never was successful um, because it was, again, opinion of mine, very bloated. It was every, he was a really good guy, Mark is a really good guy, but too good because every feature request he got he would put into the contrib module. So the contrib module was really heavy for just Markdown. So Markdown did not, so Mike Anello, the story I'm storytelling, is he couldn't update his Drupal Academy site and he runs a Drupal program and he's embarrassed. He's like, I can't migrate because the, I need the Markdown module because I want to write Markdown. I don't want to use a WYSIWYG. I want to use Markdown. And so he wrote a module and it just got the 1.1 released I think last week, and it's called um, Markdown Easy, if you want to test drive that, because even though I said Markdown is in CK Editor 5, there's only certain parts of it that are in core. But this Markdown module is pretty neat. I don't use it because I don't, it doesn't have a GitLab library, so he's looking for contributors to help him write the, the Markdown library for GitLab's flavored stuff. But um, if you do have a, a, a website and want to use Markdown in Drupal 8, 9, or 10, there's this, this handy module for it now. So I wanted to like, talk about that a little bit. And um, I went through that demo really fast because I'm a little flustered. Um, are there any questions? Like I said, these are just kind of the basics. And I want to really iterate that Markdown is portable. So you can use it from your Drupal editor to your text editor to it's, it's portable and it's human readable. And like I said, for my use case when I was on opensource.com, it was much easier for me. I didn't have to have a back and forth between my authors about how they wanted it list done. You know, I didn't, they, they were in control of how they wanted it formatted. There's less, it's just the editorial experience from the writer to the editor is just so much more convenient with Markdown versus like a Google Doc or HTML because like, um, the marketing team doesn't know how to read HTML. And like we saw, if we go in here and we look at the code, you can still read this 
and there's not a lot of extra flavors in there, so someone who doesn't have a programming background can still read this document and, and know the gist of it. So that's why I like to teach Markdown. And like I said, there's so much more to it, but those are the basics. And once you kind of play around with it, um, if you're troubleshooting, something didn't work, look at your spacing, you know, because remember we talked about the inline formatting, we didn't have spaces between our words and the formatting. We don't have spaces here, but in the headings we have a space. So if something's not quite working, it's usually because there's a space missing or you have a space. Because sometimes, you know, you get confused about which has that. So that's one of the troubleshooting things. And remember, there's a few different ways to do it. So if you have a favorite keystroke, you know, that makes it nice too. You know, I don't like to underscore, but I can hit that asterisk real easy. So I use asterisks more than I use underscores. And then um, I do work for the Linux Foundation. Um, I don't do Drupal anymore, but we um, we have a thing if y'all want to like test drive some trainings or like take a certification. If you're between jobs, we have like entry level uh, exams that are real nice you, that you can have on your resume. We we decided to do a we started this a while ago for something else, but. We have a discount code where you can get 25% off if you want to take a training or certification through the Linux Foundation. So and we're working real hard with the Drupal Association to make Drupal more of a public product that we can maybe have some Drupal tests on our certification program instead of just the Acquia tests. So that's something that we're working on as a community um, because we need more than just the Acquia exams for our community, something that's like less cost prohibitive um, and a little bit more uh, accessible to our tests are accessible. So, any questions? Okay. Yeah. I had a question about um, the tables, actually. So, if, if, you're, if, you, for, if you look at the source so that you have up here, it almost seems kind of arbitrary, like the line that I guess defines the number of columns that's immediately under the table headers. Mm -hmm. Oh, are there? you mean the the, da the dashes? Yeah, sorry. yeah, they are arbitrary. Okay, so yeah, I guess so. How? Okay, they're just arbitrary. Yeah. Okay, so you, so you could put like two in there, and it would I still think you have to do at least three. Okay, but okay. but yeah, it's not it's not like the uh, specific to the characters. Right. The user. Okay. Right. And it doesn't it, that doesn't isn't what assigns a width. The no, the, the text the assigns the width. Okay. Or no, 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 no. Oh, you're right. That is, let's see. Let's try it. Okay, so let's look at this first one. Might be the width. Yeah, because the middle should be the largest if it's based on the So. Unless it's going by the header. Yeah, I think it's going by the header. It's facing it because if we look at the dashes um, in that middle one, we have more dashes in the middle, but it's not. Um, so that's completely arbitrary. Okay. And you can do this in things like discourse and things like that, like for your statistics, you know, so tables are nice, like, you know, if, uh, for displaying data, a little bit easier for some folks so you don't have to have a spreadsheet for them. And if you're giving like author stats or, you know, who's contributing to what, you know, if, uh, it usually, I, I don't know if you can do it in Slack or not. I, I don't have Slack on my machine because it's, uh, I, we can't at the Linux Foundation, but um, I'd be curious to see if you could do a table. Because there's some markdown you can do in Slack, and I know they just did a huge overhaul for accessibility. Um, I don't know if anyone, I don't know if the Drupal Slack has changed yet or not. I haven't checked it for a few days, but um, I'm curious to see if uh, some of this GitLab flavored stuff works in Slack. Because some of the, you know, the formatting, the code formatting works and like the strike through and the, and that kind of thing, so. Did, you had a question, yeah? I like to break things. Um, can I put things like tables in the full chart? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, but let's. It'd be cool. <laughs> Not that it's readable anymore. But. Yeah. Um.
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> up. so no, I bet there's there might be a way if you like do like a little bit of programming stuff, but I, again, I'm not that literate with um, Markdown's about as complex language as I get beyond HTML and PHP. So, and I get annoyed when I have to write it. So, yeah, if if you go back to the um, code block example, if I was reading the yeah, so if I were reading that, I would see that your initial backtick that's in parentheses should begin that code block. How come it doesn't? What, what am I not seeing? It's right here. No, I understand that. Um, go a line up. The one that's in parentheses should begin the code block. How come it doesn't? It doesn't have a closing? Oh. Why not? It's got a closing afterwards. Oh, because it's a one line thing? Yes. So if there were a second backtick on line five, would that screw that up? These are these are why I get annoyed when I have to write work down because I'm not sure of the rules. I'm not so sure what you're asking. Put a back tick at the end of that sentence on line five. I want to I want to know why the first back tick isn't trying to make a code block. You have to have this one. And yeah, you have to have it opening and closing. So if there so was if just I was an arbitrary to... back tick later in that next sentence, that would create a code block and you wouldn't intend one. No. No, because I don't have spaces. So if there was an arbitrary one, if there was a space there, it wouldn't. Or yes, what it would. If you yeah, put a, what if you put another tick right after the the in that line? If that would test it. So the back tick here. Yeah. Okay. I, I know I don't know the rules well enough to. So there. Well, it shows it's, that it's going. Yep. To, Yeah. So. So yes, it's annoying. It no, it's annoying. just it, that's the source of my frustration <laughs> is the not knowing the rules well enough. Okay. To understand how I can not break right. them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get screwed up by the spacing and yeah. stuff all the time because I don't use it all the time. I, I just use it occasionally. I use HTML much more so. Yeah, like like I said, when you flip over or a lot of the programs, you you can have something on both sides. Like as you're writing it, it will render it on the other side. Uh -huh. um, yeah, that would be helpful. I think like uh, most of those, like VS Code and all of those, you can like pop out the window and you can look at it while it's being rendered. So not so good on the, like your plain text editors. Like if you use something like you know BB Edit or something mm -hmm. like that, you c it doesn't render it for you. It's so that right. might be where your learning curve might have to happen more on an IDE that does rendering versus a plain text editor. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, well, but I if something... I don't know if that has, uh, if that supports Markdown or not. Mm, I don't know. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a Windows thing. Probably no one else uses Windows. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I work for the Linux Foundation and I don't use Linux, yeah. so it's okay. <laughs> Anything else you want to break? No. no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but again, like if something doesn't work out right, it's usually a spacing issue. So that's one good thing. Like if it doesn't work, it's usually because you had a space or the space wasn't there. So and then once, like like I said, it's just muscle memory, like anything else. Once you start using it and, and applying it, like it becomes pretty pretty easy to use. It's really fast. Like I said, I'm lazy too. Like I don't want to like. Most of the time I don't have a mouse because I have kids and they've taken the battery or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, so I, it, for me to like, oh, I gotta like highlight something and I have a palsy, so like highlighting something doesn't always. It's just complicated for me to like go and then, you know, hit hit the editors or the you know the WYSIWYG button for it. So yeah. it like eliminates a lot of keystrokes for for people too, and that's what makes it more accessible too. I think. Yeah. So, and you don't have to have a WYSIWYG, so. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.